Welcome to our Minnehaha County Commission meeting. I'm going to ask that you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. housekeeping business. If you have one of these, you may want to put it on silent mode just to avoid any embarrassment. All of our meeting documents are in the three ring binder on the end of the podium here. Um, and they're also available in the auditor's office if you ever want to see them. Um, if you need a listening device, um, see one of our county staff, they can set you up. And we're going to move into our agenda and look for a motion to agenda, uh, uh, amend our agenda, correct? No? Okay. Okay, look for a motion to approve our, oh, approve the agenda. I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Motion to approve. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. Now we got the minutes, and I think we're going to amend our minutes. I'm going to make a motion to amend the regular commission minutes, so do you want to do, do the special commission minutes first? So I make a motion to um, approve the special commission meeting minutes. Okay, we had a special Second. commission meeting. Okay, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. And now we'll move on to our regular commission meeting minutes. Commissioner Karski. Com Commissioner, yes. I would make a motion to amend the regular commission meeting minutes uh, to add in the section entitled public hearing a reference to ordinance, ordinance number 5821. And I would also amend those regular commission meeting minutes uh, so that the first uh, several motions are reordered to correspond um, to the um, order that those items appeared on our agenda for that meeting. Because I stumbled through those two. So we have a motion. And a second. And a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. So that was a motion to amend. Now we Correct. need a motion to approve. That's my motion. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Oh, same sign. Motion carries. All right. Bills to be paid in the amount of $906,369.01. Pay the bills. Motion and a second. Comments? Commissioner Barth. Uh, today's bills include uh, 121000 uh, towards uh, the highway garage project, uh, 195000 transfer to Metro Communications, and 211000 towards culvert replacement. Thank you, Commissioner. You're kind of far away from your mic, so I don't know if everybody can hear you real well. I'm sorry. We'll, but we'll take that in the, in the minute, so good enough. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. We have numerous reports, including uh, register of deed statements of revenue for April, May, and June, auditor's account with the county treasurer for May of 2021, human services 2021 second quarter reports from Minnehaha and Lincoln counties and one Sioux Falls. Minnehaha County Regional Juvenile Detention Center report for June of 2021. Minnehaha County Regional Juvenile Detention Center second quarter report for 2021 and the Minnehaha County 2021 second quarter EMS report. All those again are available on the end if you would like to see them. All right, moving on to personnel actions. Look for a motion to approve routine personnel actions. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Comments, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. <coughs> motion carries. Don't think we have any updates from Personnel, okay, we have no abatements recommended for approval. Um, notice and request, we have notice of disinterment permit issued by the South Dakota Department of Health for the remains of Daniel Buckholz. Um, planning and zoning notices, there are none. And now we come to our comp petition for compromise of lien. We have two separate requests for compromise of lien and I'll turn it over to Melinda. She does a great job with this. Good morning, commissioners. Melinda Storley, commission office. Is that can you, can you hear me all right? I'll speak louder. Okay. It's on. I don't think it's working. Yeah. Okay. okay. The um, first compromise of lien, uh, the petitioners are requesting a motion to compromise two liens with no payment, DPNO 40671, with a balance of $21,278.91. 
and DPNO 75408 with a balance of $690. They are asking that the commission consider the circumstances that affected their ability to make payment on each of the liens. In their narrative, they have expressed challenges and events over the last 20 years and their desire to have the liens compromised. They have also included a testimony published for a nonprofit organization for greater understanding. The couple is in the process of purchasing a home for $215,000 and are expecting to close on August 9th. They do not offer any payment to apply to the liens on the recommendation of their bankruptcy attorney and closes a letter to the commission from the attorney expressing his position on the matter. The financial imp information within the application lists uh, $53,699.04 of net income, assets of $4,716.35, and liabilities totaling $131,009.79. Their two most recent paychecks show combined earnings of $5,037.24. They also offer a breakdown of their monthly expenses for your review. The 2020 joint income taxes indicate wages of $39,104 with no refund. They are here if you have any questions you'd like them to answer for you. Okay, thank you, Melinda. Any questions from the Commission of Melinda? Okay, so what we'll do now is, um, the petitioner is here, and if they would like to um, stand where they are, you don't have to give your name or introduce yourself, but if you would like to add anything to the um, story for consideration of the Commission as we discuss the request to basically eliminate this debt to the county um, and why we should do that. So, floor is yours. Right where you are is fine. Thank you very much. I'll turn it over to the commission for discussion or questions. Commission members. Chairman. Commissioner Bart. For those that are uh, watching and uh, stuff, you know, when, when the county provides services to people, whether it's for medical or uh, rent even, uh, uh, we keep, uh, keep track of who is receiving that assistance and a lien is put on them which really only applies when they come into uh, uh, buying property or settling a lawsuit or something. And uh, I know that the applicant here uh, has received advice that bankruptcy would clear this stuff, uh, but it doesn't. And there are you know, 200,000 people in this county that are owed this money and the county, uh, I believe we have something like $49 million outstanding uh, in these uh, liens that we, uh, we try to collect from. And in order to continue to provide people uh, with uh, these services, uh, uh, we need to have money. And uh, I just wanted to throw that out as a commentary as to how we get to where we are on these. Well, we have two items here today. It's a very long narrative, a long story that goes with this, and um, it's hard not to be sympathetic, and at the same time, it's you know, balancing that sympathy with what the needs of the county are. Um, this is a very, one of the harder ones I've had to look at in a long time. So I'm looking for input from my commission members. Yes, if you'd like to further comment. Where they would 
So from what I'm understanding, you're saying the bank would be willing to subordinate the, the property um, to the county. state's attorney kind of help us with that if i understand what he's proposing he's wanting the county to subordinate our claim yeah. to the bank's loan so a mortgage so I, it's unfortunate mr rock <coughs> didn't ask that question before today's hearing to give me a chance to research that but if i'm required to issue an opinion right from the, the table i would say i wouldn't necessarily support that concept it'd be just whatever you're willing to do on that Somebody on the phone, Carol? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, I guess, Mr. Chairman, I, I would point out also that uh, there's no interest on these liens. And so as the years go by, where a normal uh, loan would uh, accrue thousands of dollars of interest, uh, you know, the, the first debt on this list started in 1999. Um, and during this period, uh, no, no payments of any kind have been made. Uh, we always look positively at small payments of any size that a person would make. Uh, sometimes we get people paying us uh, $25 a month, uh, and that's, that's very positive. Um, and it's... Uh, but the idea that we would, uh, uh, you know, just forgive almost twenty-two thousand, well, twenty-one thousand um, dollars, is is just not. Uh, I, I don't know who would do that in their personal life, and I don't know that I can do that on behalf of the hundreds of thousands of people in Minnehaha County. So, more comments or looking for motions? I guess the only question I have, I imagine there's been earnest money put down on this house and if um, the action of this commission is to not um, compromise the lien, is that earnest money lost? Do we know? I don't know what the purchase agreement says. Thank you. I'm struggling with this for a couple of reasons. One, I feel by not approving it, we're kicking you while you're trying to get back up. You owed a debt to society and you paid it and you're trying to make a better life for yourself and your family. Um, I can't make a motion, but I, I understand the, the needs of the county and you know, in the whole scope of things, it's a small amount of money. Um, comparatively, it's a large amount of money on an individual basis. And 
Yeah, I'm, I'm really trying to reconcile this and figure it out. Um, Mr. Chairman, again, uh, you know, having you in your own home and paying property taxes is a great idea for us. But as I look at your finances, you, you owe $130,000 outside of a, a mortgage on a house. And uh, I just don't see how you can uh, uh, support that even once you're in, the, in there. I mean, how are you going to pay a mortgage? How are you going to pay back these, these other debts? And uh, uh, again, uh, if you'd been making $25 a month payments for uh, eight months, that would have been very helpful. And I would recommend you start doing that and then come back to us. Yes, sir. You received legal advice, and I understand that, sir. Yes. yes. So, I mean, I, I'm also very torn about this. Um, I mean, I would agree that the um, that we applaud you guys for trying to to take care of debts and to try to move forward. Um, and I would also say that we really don't have any precedent since I've been on the commission for forgiving debt pretty much wholesale like this. Um, without, I mean, even with $500, a payment is not a, a very significant percentage of the payment. Um, and I, I don't know who you talk to, and I'd be surprised if anybody in the auditor's office said you couldn't make payments because that's pretty common practice. Um, but um, I, I tend to think um, at this point that it would probably makes sense for us to, to not just forgive the loan, to give you an opportunity to make some payments and, um, and then to move forward at that point. I would agree. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, we've settled most of these at 50% uh, when they were signif significant uh, debt. And, uh, to try to get people back on their feet and be part of a productive community and also obviously uh, be a tax support to the county. Uh, so 50% is the normal um, payment process that we would go through. And then uh, there's two different pieces of this. One is for poor relief, which I think that we would probably eliminate, uh, but we can take that as a second motion. Uh, right now, I kind of feel like everyone else is that we need to have some payment process that we need to work with for a while before we can make a decision because that has been the policy in the past. Looking for a motion. Mr. Chairman, I um, am not inclined to forgive this lien. I would say, though, if they were to make payment of $10,000, I could forgive the, the whole thing. Um, so I'll make a motion to settle it for $10,000 uh, or else deny it. So the motion is to compromise the lien for $10,000. If they can find a way to come up with that, the lien will be compromised. Yes, and, sir. Um, okay. So if there's a way for them to help make that happen, okay. So I'll second that motion. So we have a motion and a second to compromise for $10,000. Um, and a second. Roll call vote. Demigod? Aye. Aye. Barth? Aye. Bender? Aye. Kirsty? Aye. Motion carries. So it's not what you're looking for, but it is a compromise on a compromise. So um, if you can try to um, get help or whatever it takes, um, we wish you well. 
So, Mr. Chairman, I, I just uh, would say, you know, going forward, you know, if you can't do it this way, start making small payments, mm -hmm. and and come back uh, in a year or whatever. Okay, thank you. If you go down to the auditor's office, um, you can talk to the auditor. I don't think he's up here. Ah, yeah, there he is. Do you have somebody, a staff down there you should talk to, Ben? Yeah, we can talk to Ben Nelson or Ben Nelson down here. Okay. Thank you. And you, you're free to leave if you want. You, don't, you can stick around for the rest if you like what's going on here, but you're free to leave if you wish. All righty. Second um, compromise request. <clears throat> the um, second compromise is for DPNO 88470 in the amount of $5,782.80 in full with payment of $1,000. This balance that I just read, 578280, is as of 71421. He made a couple of payments here during the last month. The petitioner originally came to the commission to have the lien compromised in full with no payment on October 2015. His request was denied with a recommendation from Commissioner Barth to make small payments over a period of time. He comes now with the same position he held in 2015 regarding payment in that he does not believe he should have to pay for public defender representation, but he did pay. Oh, pardon me. Is this you? Putting words in my mouth. Okay, we'll let you, we'll give you a second. Um, anyway, uh, regarding the payment, but he did pay $60 over the last month. He states that he has recently divorced and is needing to have the lien released in order to f allow his ex-wife, who has all rights, title, and interest to the property, to refinance the home. Upon refinancing, the petitioner is to receive uh, funds to equalize the division of the property at the time of closing. If he is able to remove the lien from the property, if not, he will receive a lesser amount. Hence the urgency to have the lien compromised. However, he is not asking that the property be released from the lien. He is asking for the lien to be released in full. The financial information within the application lists assets of uh, 288968 and liabilities totaling $120,381. He is self-employed and only provided a bank statement showing one month of transactions totaling $1,526.83. The 2020 joint income tax shows an income of $45,123 with a refund of $8,921. He was not able to provide a copy of the signed divorce or signed stipulation agreement. There is no refinancing transaction pending at this time of the lien, and he has not quick claimed his interest in the real property to his ex-spouse. Um, he is here. Yep. <laughs> I didn't think he yep. was going to make so it. So <laughs> we'll, we'll go to if mm -hmm. the commission has questions from Melinda on the data that she's prepared. Okay, so the petitioner now is your opportunity to um, maybe clarify or... Um, give us your story. So. I apologize for interrupting. Um, my name is Jerry Gladys, and I'm requesting a waiver of compromise in the amount of the county wood lien that has been um, attached to my residence currently at 1320 Meadowbrook Trail in Brandon. Um, in 2014, I utilized the Minnehaha County Public Defender's Office to defend myself against alleged crimes. On May 11, 2015, the state of South Dakota dismissed all charges against me. Um, since that time, I have attempted um, to build a career that would allow me to pay back the amounts owed for the legal services um, I received, but unfortunately, that has not happened yet. Um, I made a career change that, I had it worked out, um, would have been allowed me to pay off my debt, but unfortunately, um, the outcome was not positive, and I was not able to make ends meet at the time. Um, I was at the start of a promising business, um, um, at the start of DJ business, um, which I've done part-time with my father for since I was 12 years old, um, something I know really well. Um, when COVID-19 struck and closed my opportunity to grow my business, um, I've, spent a, um, I've spent a significant part of the pandemic unemployed. Um, I was planning a new business, um, hoping to open that up. Um, and due to like, circumstances, that's been delayed as well. So. Um, <coughs> I am still operating my business, um, but it has been slow to get back, mostly karaoke, um, and I don't expect the revenue to really pick up until next year. Um, in the midst of the pandemic, my wife and I ended up getting a divorce, which has caused me to um, incur increased expenses. Um, I have to move out of my home uh, to an apartment 
Sons and provide a new living arrangements for my two minor sons um, who will be with me 50% of the time. Um, I would ask the county commission to um, waive all or some of the county aid liens related to services so I may be able to provide a suitable living space for my sons as we embark on our new family um, out west. Okay, thank you, sir. Commission, questions? Comments? Commissioner Bender. I would, um, I would say that I, the same analysis applies that we applied to the last EPNO, and that we really are not in a position to, um, to compromise a DPNO for less than uh, fifty percent of, of what's owed. That's been our typical practice. Um, I do really appreciate the recent payments. Um, I noted that back in two thousand and fifteen, when we um, heard a similar request, we had recommended at that time, I believe Commissioner Barth had recommended that small payments uh, be made and they, they did finally just start, um, we did finally start receiving small payments this summer. I'd recommend that continue, uh, but I'm not in favor of compromising um, or removing the lien at this time. At all or at least at 50 percent? Well, I, I would take a payment of 50 percent, yes. Okay. We would need to have to, in order to compromise, we will have to see what the motion is, sir, so we will um, take that into consideration. Mr. Chairman, I would just point out that we don't charge interest on this, so the, the debt will be the same a year from now as it is today unless there are uh, some payments made. And so we're not dunning people to, uh, you know, come forward with, with any money but uh, we do appreciate those payments very much. But again, uh, it's, uh, when you were here uh, five years ago, uh, this, we discussed this, and uh, we only had three payments in the last six weeks. Um, and I, I do appreciate them. Uh, it'd be uh, good for you to make uh, small payments for the next year and, and come back to us. But 50 cents on the dollar is actually a pretty good deal. And, uh, you know, again, there, uh, if, if I owed you 5,000 uh, bucks, I doubt you would forgive it if I just made a $40 payment. Mr. Bender or Benica? Sorry. No, that's fine. It's an insult to her, that's for sure. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Better looking. I would agree it's the same conversation that we had with the previous uh, applica application, so uh, the 50 percent is kind of our policy, and I think we need to stick with that. Okay. I'd make a motion to compromise the lien for a payment of $2,901. Um, Second. So we have a motion to, uh, for compromise for 2901, so that would be what would be required to be paid in order for this lien to be removed. Um, roll call vote, please. Bart? Aye. Bender? Aye. 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 Motion carries 4 to 0. So, moving on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Moving on, today, this is the opportunity for public comments. So, if anybody is here to talk to a item that is not on our agenda, we welcome your um, comments to the commissioners, and we just ask you. Um, tell your story and anybody here? Nobody for public comment? Alrighty. We'll move on to regular business. Um, we have a public hearing to consider motion to declare property legally, de legally described as Tract 1, Gaddis Edition, Section 18, T101NR50W. Wayne Township, a public nuisance, and an act, South Dakota codified law, 21-10-06. And we have Kevin Hochman here. Good morning, Kevin. Yes, good morning. I'm Kevin Hochman from the County Planning Department. Uh, yes, this is a, a request or a, a consideration of public nuisance. Uh, we received uh, or the violation at the property legally described, and the address is 26449 467th Avenue. Uh, in the winter of 2020 and 21, uh, 
planning staff received uh, complaints about two different properties in this area, and this is one of the two. Uh, both complaints will be heard today. Uh, the complaint about this property specifically noted inoperable vehicles in the trees, unlicensed trailers, and goats that escaped from their pens. Uh, staff visited the property several times, uh, and in April uh, found, uh, did more of a, a thorough uh, search of the property, looked at the property closely, and did find several vehicles, old farm equipment, and other things in the, in the trees and around the farm. Uh, since the, the first letter was sent out on December 1st of 2020, the property owner has removed several drunk vehicles and other miscellaneous items. Um, most recently, uh, our staff uh, worked with them through the spring and in June uh, uh, sent out the final letter because uh, there were still items that remained on the property. Um, I'll go over kind of the location here and the, some of the site photos. Uh, so this is be the location of the property. This is about a mile and a half west of Sioux Falls, and there's a small subdivision development called West Acres uh, just to the east of this location. Some aerial photography of the property. Uh, some of the examples of uh, photos that were taken, um, some vehicles. Uh, here you can see the, the enclosure for the goats. The property does have two houses on the, on the site. Uh, uh, one was uh, a replacement for like a farmhand pro house that was been on the property for many years prior to density zoning. Um, there you can see, <coughs> excuse me, and there you can see that one of the campers as well on the property. Um, some of the, the farm type equipment that are in the trees, this is from the April site visit. And then at some point here I get to the June visit. So June, you can see that there's a couple of trailers. Uh, the one trailer has a hot tub on it and did not find uh, uh, license plates in those trailers. Uh, then there's the uh, tall grass that kind of made it hard to see some of the things. But then in July, again, the trailers were there, the grass is mowed, but it, you, you can see that some of those items were removed out of the tree line. Um, and far in the back, you can see that some of them also have been remained. Um, so we'll kind of flip through these. Um, yeah, so uh, staff, uh, many of these remaining items uh, staff found uh, were, are also commonly found in other farm yard properties throughout the county, uh, but the public nuisance ordinance does still state that unlicensed trailers and inoperable vehicles are specifically required to be placed in inside of an enclosed building or licensed. Um, the Minneapolis uh, County Commission can uh, consider the public nuisance ordinance for Tract 1 Gaddis edition and enact uh, South Dakota Codified Law 2106, which allows the county to declare a public nuisance and allow the county to clean up the property to defray the cost of the, to the property owner. Um, I believe the property owner is here, uh, as well as the person who um, uh, who complained has been ke keeping up with staff, and I believe that they they said that they were going to be here. I guess I don't recognize them because I haven't met them in person. So um, at that, I can hear for any questions. Okay. So questions from the commission of Kevin. All righty. Um, excuse my lack of train of thought here, but do we typically take comments from the property owner at this point? It's a public hearing, so you have proponents we and do. opponents. Okay, so we have proponents and opponents. So um, those in favor of declaring this a public nuisance, I, uh, probably the person that filed the complaint would be a good example. Um, now would be your opportunity to address the commission. So anybody who's in favor of declaring this a public nuisance. We'll hear from you, then we'll go to opponents, 
and then give the proponents a chance to rebut. So anybody here who's, um, are you here? Do you file the complaint? Okay, so Mr. Chairman, we Chief, need you to introduce yourself. Needs to come to the podium on yep, this. Yep, need to come to the podium, introduce yourself, and name and address. customers were an, could be anonymous if they so chose, but. Yep. It's fine. <laughs> so I'm Amber Hobart. We actually live at the property that's kind of being surrounded by the three of these on all three sides of us, the two properties. So we did file the complaint. Um, we have had an incredible amount of varmints that we are dealing with all of the time, like on our deck. And honestly, it's not great to look out your windows on three sides of your house to have all of this just sitting there. I can't tell you the number of people that have made comments about it when the first time they come to our house. What is that across the road? It's a mess. I mean, that's, that's exactly what it is. And I know you guys have pictures. There were pictures supplied. I don't think probably anybody here wants to live beside that, nor do we want to live beside that. And we don't want to have to put up with the constant varmints and things and just junk laying around. We would ask that you go ahead and enforce the public nuisance to get it cleaned up. Okay. Do you want to say your last name one more time, please? Yeah, it's Hobert, H-O-B-E-R-T. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Chairman. Commissioner. Questions. Have you noticed any uh, uh, progress towards some of the uh, machinery t being taken away? We did see a few cars that were being pulled out, but honestly, the cars that were being pulled out from the DD property went across the road to the other property. We watched several of those leave the one driveway and go directly over to the property across the street. So. So the picture is up here. Where would you live in relation to this property? So our house is the one where you can see there's the whole tree grove. Yep, right where you are. That's So it's behind us, it's beside us, and it's in front of us. Okay. So do you share the driveway then? No, we have our own driveway. The road to the property must be a township road? Well, it's off of 467th. We have a driveway, and the two others share their driveway. Okay. Other questions? Any other proponents for declaring this a um, nuisance? Anybody else here to talk to it? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, opponents to declaring this a nu nuisance. Maybe the property owner here to defend what they have going on out there. Anybody? Please, yes. Okay, my name is Dawn Deedee. I live at the property at 26449 467th Avenue. I lived there with Larry Morgan. Um, he passed away two years ago on June 12th. He had a heart attack in bed at June 9th at 6.30 in the morning. Went to Sanford Hospital and he passed away on the 12th at 1130 in the morning. Um, one question that Amber mentioned um, in front of her house, there's a nuisance. Um, we live in back of her to the west, and there is six rows, a tree grove there, so there's no possible way she could see anything in my property. Kevin came out to my house, and he couldn't even see my property from the street or from the gravel road. I do admit that Larry had a few cars out there, which had been removed from Terry Gardner, which is sent behind me. He has removed those, and he is, he is a scrapper, so he has been taking care of those. He took him to Iowa, and he's got a red Chevy pickup, which is probably in the 80s. He's got that pickup. That's the only one he has to take to Iowa to get rid of yet. All my other vehicles have been taken care of and taken to Iowa to the scrap yard. Um, I have, he removed a trailer of mine yesterday, which is to my 71 Chevy that I had redone, and I sold that. Terry picked up the box trailer yesterday. We do have a paddle boat alongside my Quonset, on the east side of my Quonset, and there's a few 4x4 
poles, uh, their green treated poles, which I admit that Larry has put those next to the Quonset, which will be removed. And um, in the middle of May or the end of May, I was out hanging up my clothes and my, I had my dog with me and my dog kept barking and barking and barking and I looked up and here's a car in my tree strip to the northeast corner, which I believe was Leesinger surveying my land to see what he could complain about. I went in the house and called the 911. Three sheriffs came out and pulled their guns and ran out my tree strip and this car disappeared. But they said they did see car tracks alongside my tree strip. So there was somebody out there watching me. I have put up with, talk about a nuisance, I have put up with this. I have lived out there for 31 years with Larry and enjoyed every minute of it and we have a gorgeous property. We have been cleaning up that property ever since Larry bought it from Richard Gaddis, Donald Gaddis, which was his dad. I don't know who owned the property, Richard or Donald. But anyway, Richard lives on the gravel road. He retired from Billion Motors. He was a mechanic. I waved to that guy. I stop and talk to him. I check on him because he's the only one at his property to make sure he's all right. I have not any complaints from anybody except when I get this letter in the mail. Okay. So people have been, I assume it was Kevin because I don't know who else would be watching me. And you know, I had the sheriffs out, three of them, and there's been other incidents. I have my na my renters, which Ma'am, I guess we'd like to keep it, you know, talk about the property. I, okay, I understand Richard, there might okay. be neighbor issues, but let's just talk about the property. Okay. so. Um, and, and I keep my yard mowed up and everything, and I keep everything cleaned up, and I have a burn barrel, which Terry brought over to me, and that's where I burn my garbage in the barrel, which we're always outside, and I just keep my area cleaned up, and I have pictures of my area if you would like to see them on my phone. I think we have plenty of pictures at this time. Okay. So, okay. And as far as the horse trailer, Larry's been gone for two years. The first letter I get is in January. With the kind of weather that we had, how can I get it cleaned up in two months? Mm -hmm. okay. You know, it's, I, I'm, I'm doing my best. I'm doing my best as a single person. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Any questions? Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, you, stay, uh, you might stay have some back. questions, ma'am, please. Oh. Um, so I think that, you know, for some of the metal objects, uh, there are uh, uh, car crushers and stuff that'll come and, and pay you for that stuff. And, uh, you know, are you working on trying to continue? I am working on it every day. Every day. I work at Sanford Hospital from 3 in the morning till 1.30 in the afternoon. Okay, so you're not working at your property. I am working that. on the property. I have Kevin living with me, a friend of mine, and he is, he's working on it. He's been there when, when Terry Garner has been there to help him. I also had to put in a new culvert because he blocked me off from entering my back property. So if we gave you more time, would you be able to clean it up uh, further? What else has to be cleaned up? Well, if you have uh, junked cars and I don't have any vehicles. junk cars, they're all gone. That's been taken care of. That's all done. Okay. Well, I think we could check that out. Uh, these images show some vehicles that look to have uh, junk status. Uh, Another some question. The first letter I got, the first letter I received in the mail said that all vehicles have to be licensed or have to be removed. And they're gone. They are gone. Super. What about varmints? Uh, do you have, you know? They are gone. They're at Lawrence Kimball, the grandpa's house. They're gone. They were only at the house for, say, maybe six months at the longest. The what? The goats. Are you the, the two referencing? goats. Okay, I think he's talking about rodents. Raccoons. Yes. Yes. Raccoons and oh, I, I have no control over raccoons. That's nature. I have no control over raccoons. There's raccoons when I go to work at 2.30 in the morning, when I go down my lane, 
at 2.30 in the morning, there's raccoons down the lane, there's raccoons down the road. Yeah. Commissioner Bender. So I'd like to just keep it to the pictures that we have and so that I can understand exactly the, f the facts of the situation. So we have a picture um, from the 21st of July, so just within the last week, that shows a, um, I'm not good at vehicles, but a vehicle, an old vehicle, older pickup maybe, um, in your tree line. Has that vehicle been removed? Those both, there was two of them from Porter Williams, and those have both been removed. Terry Gardner removed those. It okay, was so a the blue one and a green one. What about the one in the picture that we can see right now, the one to the lower right? Well, that's been removed yesterday. That is the back end of my 71 Chevy. That go, went to a salvage yard up by Edgerton yesterday. Okay, and the, and the vehicle in the lower right? Those have been removed. Those were Porter Williams. Um, he removed those quite a while ago. Yeah, those this, went through the same salvage yard. Okay, this picture is dated July 21st, 2021. So within the last week, that vehicle was there. And you're saying that that vehicle disappeared in the last week? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah. I got this yeah, those are gone. pickup box trailer. Mr. Chairman, if, if he's going to speak, he needs to go to the microphone. Yeah. Uh, sir, would you introduce yourself? Um, you're giving yeah. testimony on a public hearing, so we need your name. The microphone. Terry Garner, Terry? I live, I live yeah. on the Cooley Farm across the road, and I'm the other property. I rent that property, and uh, Don is a neighbor. I knew her husband, and when he passed, and, and I heard about this problem, I, you know, the Bible instructs us to help the widows, and I would like to say that it wasn't until her husband died that, that this complaint, this whole thing started. Larry, with Larry there, it didn't happen. But anyhow, I help. I've been helping her, and when the lady said that everything went over to my house, it did, and went on a semi truck and went to the crusher or the shredder in Sioux City. I mean, I've got one pickup left that I got from her, and everything else went to the salvage yard. Okay. You know, so she's her place is looking really good. My place is not looking as good. But it will, it will, and well, I just I, I, I needed to, I, I needed to help her okay. get the situation. I'd like to add that her place, unless you had a helicopter, couldn't even you couldn't even see her place from the road. It wasn't like there was only one person that it was bothering, and that was the lady that was up here a little bit ago. And I understand her concerns, but I also don't think she's the property owner over there where she's complaining about. Um, that's okay. just my opinion, but um, I'll continue to help anything she needs. I will help. I've been paying her for the stuff too. You said things, you can be paid for that stuff. She has been paid for it. I'm treat, treating her fair and, and uh, I've got more of a project over at my place. Her place should be no concern at this point. And me, it's a, it's a different story. I need some time to finish up with what I'm doing over there now that I've got her her place taken care of. But, you guys uh, are are not related, my understanding. No, we're not related. Okay. He okay. lives across the road from me. Okay. I you. didn't really even know her that well. I only met her a couple times before Larry died, but Larry was a good friend. Any other questions of either of these individuals? Can you just say your last name one more time? Your Pardon? last name? Garner. G-A-R-N-E-R. -E -R. Thank you. And do you have his, his street address? I think you need a street address as 26456 well. 4656 467th Avenue. Thank you. Other questions of either of these individuals? Commissioner Bender. So I'm once again, I'm just trying to deal with the facts. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a picture of a boat and a trailer with a hot tub on top of it. Um, are those both licensed? Okay, as far as that, uh, that's, the habitat pile and there's no burning in Minneapolis County right now so I just want to know about the picture of the boat and the trailer with the hot tub on it lower right I don't know oh that's at my renter's house that's that's my renter Eric and Kanisha Knutson um, what's wrong with the boat? <coughs> 
I just am trying to figure out if it's licensed. Yeah, it is. They take it out every day to Wall Lake. Okay. And the trailer next to it, do you know if that's licensed? That's licensed. They take it out every day. That there, that's a hot tub. That is licensed. Um, they bought that from, I don't know who, but they just bought it. So it is licensed. And the boat they take out every day to Wall Lake mm. to put their two kids. Okay. And the mattress? And behind that, he has put a he has put a big dirt pile there, and I end up going trimming all the weeds and everything. And he has had a surveyor out there showing and putting stakes in the survey land. He has piled dirt up just for his own convenience to, to aggravate me. And I go and trim all the weeds and everything, which he should be doing. Well, just just so you know, I th I think Kevin needs to come out and look at her place again. Uh, she's I think Kevin even told her she's done a she's done a great job at, of of working on this, considering you know Don's not a strong person, and she does have a guy there that helps her. Yeah, I think she's done a lot, and I think she deserves uh, your consideration to uh, uh, anything else that. Kevin can come out and look, and anything else, I'll help her with. I'll go to landfill for her, whatever it takes to, to get it. Thank you for that, sir. Um, anybody else here to speak in um, opposition to this being a public nuisance? Any other, anybody else willing to testify? Seeing none, I will give the complainant the opportunity to rebut, so if you would please would have a seat, that would be great. And if you have anything to add, to from what you've heard before that would be good if I, I need you to come to the microphone if you're going to speak I would just say that these items they're still sitting there the trailer hasn't moved for months there's a broken down hot tub on it we absolutely did have a surveyor out because when they had their goats there they just put up a pen that was about six to eight feet onto our property and so we absolutely had a surveyor out because this has just been one thing after another and it's really not the issue of if you can see something from the road or not. We have property that goes entirely around that property. I have to look at that. It's not a matter of can you see it from the road. Just because you may or may not be able to see something from the road doesn't mean that anybody who lives in the area should have to be continuing to deal with that. And those, the boat that is sitting there, that trailer is not licensed. The camper they previously had sitting there was also not licensed. So as of just a few days ago, you can obviously see all of that stuff is there. And it's still there as of this morning. And this perpetual give us more time, give us more time has honestly, you've had your time. You were given dates and you didn't clean it up. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Any questions? Can I say something? Um, um, no, we're past that for right now, but if somebody, if a commissioner would have a question, that would be fine. Um, at this point, we will move on to, if there's nobody else to rebut, we will move on to commission action and discussion. Mr. Chairman, I'm, uh, I'm interested in the fact that there has been some progress uh, even since the uh, uh, last week. Um, and I think that uh, no, that that in fact is the case that uh, we could have planning go look at this again, uh, say uh, around uh, September 1st or something like that, and and see if there's been additional progress. And uh, I think that uh, having a date certain for that further uh, inspection, I think, uh, um, can give the. Uh, the, the neighbor some assurance that progress could be made. Other comments? I guess I have a question for Kevin. Um, is this zoned egg? Uh, yes, this is zoned agriculture and, um, and much of the metal and stuff like I mentioned in some of these photos here that you might see like there are former ag equipment, um, and that's, that's where I commented on that much of this is similar to what can be found on any given farmstead. 
So I guess my question or you know, musings are that if it's zoned ag and you got ag implements that are sitting there, whether they're being used or not, I mean, it's not up to us to decide when you should use them, how often you should use them, how often you should move them, et cetera. I mean, ag is ag and, you know, farmyards just over time will acquire stuff. But we do have rules on vehicles. Um, what, and I, my understanding is if you have vehicles that are not licensed, they have to be in an enclosed shelter. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, and as far as the vehicles that I saw on July um, 21st visit would be that, that old pickup uh, and then the, the trailers that were mentioned at the renter's property because there, or the renter's house because there's two houses on the property. And there were, I believe, three trailers, the boat, the, the trailer with the uh, hot tub, and then an enclosed trailer that were on the property that I did not see license plates for. Okay. Tall grass isn't an issue. Noxious weeds are different. Uh, noxious weeds, if there are there, um, is an issue. Um, I didn't see uh, anything that caught my eye, at least any thistles, because he just recently uh, mowed down the grass for hay. <coughs> No, sir. Sorry. Uh, not at, not in this format. You could at, talk to him later if you wish. Um, okay. Looking for commission action. We have the option of delaying action on declaring this a public nuisance, giving them the opportunity September 1st or whatever our date we would decide to continue cleanup. Um, I don't know what we would be specifically looking for, so I would like to maybe make it specific action. Mr. Chairman, these issues can be very difficult, and uh, I, I think back to one we had where a fellow had uh, uh, 150 air conditioners piled in his front yard right along the highway, and uh, his cattle were running loose, etc. I mean, we can all pull up our socks at some point and try to make things better. I, I will make a formal motion for September 1st for a reinspection by planning, and if they're there, September 8th, that doesn't uh, hurt me any, but I'll make a motion for September 1st uh, for uh, a progress report. So I'd make a motion to defer this until after uh, September 8th is what I'll do. We have a motion. I'll second that mo motion with a comment. Please, Commissioner. I just, you know, I think there's some uh, wide disagreement in the room <coughs> about what constitutes um, coming into compliance with our ordinance and um, you know for guidance for folks here and for planning commission I think me personally as a commissioner um, I would be looking to make sure that we you know that there isn't any evidence of unlicensed abandoned vehicles on the property um, that would be the primary goal I think it I think that everybody in the room has the same goal of you know, bringing the property up to um, s compliance with our ordinances, and it sounds like there has been significant progress. And there's some disagreement in the room about what that progress consists of as of today. And unfortunately, as commissioners, we don't know. Um, we just have to listen to what people are telling us. Um, so I think it does. I think it is appropriate to um, keep um, the the process in motion you know the goats are gone a lot of the vehicles appear to be gone so checking again in September we'll make sure that if there's further progress to be made that it will be done I appreciate the testimony received about um, the desire to do that by the property owners and so uh, I think I think this is appropriate given the testimony we've received other comments uh, who's responsible for, she had mentioned, a tenant on the property that um, has a boat and trailer? It, it's still the property owner's job to make sure the tenant complies. So if they have a trailer there with a, a hot tub on it that shouldn't be there, they need to let their tenant know that by September 8th, we're expecting progress on that also. Okay. Okay. Um, so we have a motion to defer action until September 8th, when at, before that date. Um, Planning and zoning will do an inspection as close to that date as possible and um, report back and we will decide at that point if we'll take action. 
I need a roll call vote. Barth? Aye. Bender? Aye. Benega? Aye. Parsky? Aye. Motion carries. Okay. Um, moving on. Y your turn, Kevin. Go ahead. All right. Uh, so uh, this next item is another uh, public nuisance ordinance uh, consideration. Uh, the property address is 26456 467th Avenue. Uh, it's owned by Don Cooley Trust. And it's described as a southwest quarter except West Acres and except tract 58A West Acres and A tract 239 uh, X32 north of Track 9 West Acres and accept A Track 20 uh, and 349 east of Tracks 61 and 61A West Acres uh, in Section 17 10150 Wayne Township. Um, here's the map showing that property. Uh, much of the property is uh, agricultural cropland. Uh, in the top corner of it, you'll see the the farmstead there. Uh, and the some of the conditions there. Again, the uh, primary complaint noted that many trucks coming and going in the evenings with junk vehicles and inoperable vehicles stored on the site. Uh, staff first took photos on March 30th. We'll go through some of those. Uh, Reinspected uh, June 8th and found that the property was in, improved, but there were still vehicles and junk on the property. Um, and then on the 21st, again, it was a similar situation where, yes, many vehicles have been removed, but there are still junk in the property. So I'll go through some of those photos. Here's an aerial photo from 2020 of the property. Um, this is back in March. Uh, uh, some of the vehicles are being hauled out and stacked in a trailer, as you can say, see there. And then in May, a uh, site visit, uh, you can see some of the uh, other materials other than just vehicles uh, stacked in the back corner of the property. Um, and this is the main farmstead area where you can see various uh, tire rims, um, maybe some barrels, uh, other metal objects uh, on the property as well as vehicles. June visit. Uh, Back in the trees, I maybe didn't get a very good picture of it, but several vehicles have been removed out of the, the tree line there. Um, still remain. Uh, this is that kind of burn pile there of, of wood and some other things. Uh, and then the July visit. Many of the vehicles up front here that are in the line uh, are licensed properly, uh, with maybe an exception of a couple. Um, you can see some parts there in front of the garage and other equipment. Um, yeah, some other of the vehicles and equipment and parts. Uh, you can also see some of the, the progress that was made, that uh, there are definitely fewer vehicles on the site than what were in the previously uh, site visits. Um, so let's bring that back to the aerial photography. And uh, same process, uh, the South Dakota Codified Law uh, 21106 allows the, prop the county to declare a public nuisance on the property. Um, staff finds that there is abandoned property on, the prop uh, on this property and uh, requests that uh, you consider to declare a public nuisance on it. So is there any questions? Questions of Kevin. Commissioner Mr. Chairman. Bart. Kevin, uh, do they have a conditional use uh, permit to operate a business there? They do not. Uh, and that would be a, a separate kind of issue on it that, they are, that a business is being operated out of the property that is not allowed in the ag use. I guess that's my question too. I mean, an ag zone property, can you run an auto dismantling yard, a towing shop, a auto repossession, any of those types of things? No, that is not an allowed use in the A1 agricultural. And, and we could go through the process of, of doing a zoning violation, which is a different process through the ordinance. Okay. So talk to me, you know, if we decide it's not a 
public nuisance. Well, maybe it is, but it's more along the line of a zoning ordinance um, that could be addressed by your office. Yep, because then we would address it uh, th through working with the state's attorney's office uh, and as a violation of the zoning ordinance. Okay, okay, thank you. Mr. Um, Chairman, I, I, I would just further comment that should they apply for conditional use on this property, <coughs> there would be some rules put in to, you know, for access, for parking, for lighting, for storage, uh, et cetera. And uh, that in itself would perhaps tidy things up. Okay. Other questions of Kevin? Okay, this is a public hearing as my memory is refreshed. So we will take anybody that is in support of declaring this a public nuisance. Um, now would be your opportunity to um, come to the podium, give your name and address, and um, address the issue. So it's, <clears throat> excuse me, Amber Hobart. We're at 26447 467th Avenue, directly across the street from this property. Um, very much, I guess, like the last one, only this one's in worse condition than the last one. But irregardless, there's still lots of vehicles sitting there. The problems that we've had with varmints and et cetera has not improved. Yeah, have they taken vehicles out of there? Yes, are there still a pile of them there? Yes, are things being operated that aren't supposed to be? Also, yes, but we just want it cleaned up so we don't have to continue to sit and look at this day after day after day. Okay, thank you. Anybody else here to speak in favor of declaring this a public nuisance? Alrighty, we'll move on to those in opposition to those calling, uh, declaring this a public nuisance. Um, please come up to the microphone and your name and address, please. Morning. Good morning, Scott Van Ginkle, 4001 West Valhalla Boulevard, representing the family ownership of the farm. Do you wanna spell your last name, please? V-A-N-G-I-N-K-E-L. What I'd like to do is talk about the plan to clean up uh, the farmstead, but first I'm gonna ask the tenant, Terry Garner, to come up. It's kind of a two-fold plan. Um, as we know, Terry's been helping the neighbor. That situation seems to be under control. I'm gonna have him speak to the piece of uh, cleaning up his portion of this farm, then I'll come back up with your permission. And is somebody living steps. at this property? Uh, yes. And that is? Terry Garner. Okay, and that's who you're asking to come up and speak? That is correct. Okay, thank you. Hello again. I would like to start out by saying that I've been on this farm for 16 years. Okay. And even though the farm is, does need work, it's way better now than it was when I moved in there 16 years ago. I moved in there 16 years ago when it was covered with cars and weeds this high. We hauled in tons and tons of gravel. I mean, we've done a lot. I paid to have roofs put on most of the buildings there. Gutters on the house, I paid all out of my own pocket. The rent has always been reasonable there. I have a, I have a well, I don't have rural water, so I had to pay for a, a Culligan water system. Just, you know, I've, I've done a lot, lot on the place. I am in the scrap metal business. I have a, a yard in Sioux Falls that I rent for most everything. This, what showed up out at my place is just, I get busy. I get busy. With the COVID thing coming, we got really busy. I've never been so busy in my life. Ace towing is shorthand. Everybody's shorthanded. I'm a trucker and I get ace towing get calls me all the time. And it's been difficult for me to get done what I need to do. I have a hard time saying no to helping people and it, it's reflected on my own, you know, it, it, it does need, it does need addressed. And I will, uh, now that I've got Dawn's situation to where she's not gonna have a team of dump trucks come in there, well, I can work on this. I would like to ask for a 90 day extension on this to, I have the equipment, the front end loader and the equipment to get this stuff out of there in a hurry. And I can, it's just, I've got a ace joins try to get me to work again. You know, I work seven days a week and 
I will get this taken care of. Um, the neighbors, the neighbors, um, you know, I think I've been a good neighbor there, uh, despite what you see. I will say that, and Kevin mentioned this, the cars out there in front, I've got at least 10 cars licensed and insured. Uh, there that, you know, I just, rather than have car payments, I'd rather have a, have a different car to drive, you know, and I do license and insure them. I've, I've got to keep insurance on them. So that's um, what I'd like, I would like to ask for, and uh, I'll let somebody else. Uh, Questions of Mr. Gardner? Okay. I don't see anybody, sir. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I, I guess I do have a question, sir. Are you conducting a business off this property? No, I'm not conducting a business off this property, but the business does overflow there. It's, uh, I've got a tow truck there that the motor went bad in it, and um, I'm getting fuel and the oil on it, and it looks like that tow truck, I need to get it in a storage yard in town, and it may look like that's what I'm doing there, but it isn't. It just... It just, I don't know how, how it really happens. I say it's not going to happen, and, and then I wind up with more cars there than I should. So it's just, um, I've thought about the conditional use permit thing. But this is the farm on the north edge of West Acres, and these people come from town and move out there, and they don't want to live next to a, a bunch of cars. I understand that. So asking for a conditional use permit isn't probably going to fly, and I know that. So I just need to clean it up, and I will say that the property's been for sale, and I think there's a possibility that there's people interested. And if and when that if and when that happens, all these buildings. Really, this complaint didn't really happen until the roof started falling in on these on these buildings. Really. And, and I understand that. I can't even use them anymore. But they will. I, I, think, I think you'll find out from Scott that there's a plan in the making to come in and take the silos down. I mean, it, it's like between thirty and $60,000 to do it. Yep. But that's, that's in the making. Yep. You know, I don't even know how long I'm going to be there if whoever buys it is going to allow me to live there or not. I mean, that's, it's all... But I will, I will take care of the cars and, and uh, the junk, you know. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Chairman, um, Mr. Garner, so you call it a farm, but are, are you uh, planting soybeans? <laughs> Do you have horses? Do you have I, cattle? I, I did have horses, but uh, all they do is eat, and I didn't have time to. I had chickens, and uh, the raccoon issue is, is, a, is a problem. I've got a neighbor that traps them and kills them. I, I've killed three raccoons. I killed one over at Don's. I've got a, a guy that comes with the, some little rat terriers, and he searches them out in the barns. I mean, I hate raccoons. I think the governor will give you 10 bucks on it. Won't <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm doing everything I can in the raccoon business, believe me. OK. I, yeah. Thank you, sir. Anybody else here to speak in opposition to declaring this a public nuisance? Um, yes, sir. More comments? I'll finish my portion. Thank you. Um, to clarify, we understand, you know, that it needs to be cleaned up, and we will do so. Um, the Hobers don't need to look at, at this, neither do any of the neighbors. Uh, Terry will get his portion. Uh, cleaned up. Just to clarify, there is a separate tenant that farms the ground, and Terry rents the acreage, so to okay. speak. Um, so Terry, we will work side by side with him as he cleans his portion up. During that 90-day period, we will have someone come in, and we will take down the silos and the buildings. Essentially, everything except for the home uh, will be taken down, and you know any of the. Uh, tree groves that are standing and in good condition, we would leave those as well, and so forth. Uh, comment to the point that uh, the farm is for sale. Yes, we do have interest. Just to clarify, it is not sold. 
or under contract at this time, but that could take place during this 90 days as well. Okay. Uh, but it's clear the responsibility of Terry as a tenant to get his portion cleaned up and then the owners of the property to take care of the buildings and so forth, and uh, we will do that during that period. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. I think 90 days is not unreasonable, but I will say I can remember Halloween uh, snowstorm where we got 11 or 19 inches. And so suddenly we have the excuse, they were all coming yesterday to get these cars, and then it snowed 11 inches and we couldn't do it. I, I'm not going to accept that excuse. Uh, 90 days cleaned up. I, I would be willing to do that, and I'll make that motion. I'll second that. Motion and a second. Other comments? Mr. Anderson. So for a point of clarification, I really would prefer that you put a date specific. So could we say like October 29th, that's a Friday? That's my motion. Okay, thanks. And that is Scott Anderson from our Planning and Zoning Department. Thank you, Scott. I'll second that. Okay, motion and a second. Additional comments? I have one. Um, Mr. Gardner, if, if I asked if you're running a business, you said no, but you have overflow. And it looks like I'm running a business. You're running a business there, so please comply with what's ag and what's not. Um, we have a motion and a second to give to October 29th to um, clean this up. Um, roll call vote, please. Bender? Aye. Benega? Aye. Bard? Aye. Karski? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. It's always uh, interesting and sometimes difficult. All right, moving on to something different. We have a looking for our provisional budget for fiscal year 2020, 2022. Mr. Kite, good morning. Don't take it personally that everybody's leaving I, when I you will. get up. <laughs> Try not to. <laughs> good morning, Mr. Ben Kite, Auditor's Office. So yes, I'm in front of you today to ask for you to adopt provisional budget for fiscal year 2022. Um, the 2022 budget uh, totally for the county stands around $104.2 million. Uh, of that, we have uh, $72.8 million um, from general funds, about $14.4 million in highway funds, and, and then just the remainder in various other funds. Uh, some of the highlights for the uh, provisional budget, we have no ad additional opt-out dollars that are going to be used. Um, the general fund cash applied will, this year is at $6.9 million. Um, we are including a health insurance premium increase of 15%. Um, there is a matrix adjustment of 2.5% for all personnel. Uh, and we do uh, we are adding uh, four new positions um, throughout the county. And then uh, as requested at our last meeting, we uh, are allowing for a 2% increase in the ambulance fund, which amounts to a little more than uh, $3,000. Um, the, um, the budget is uh, provided uh, to you in the attachment um, in the form of a motion. I'd ask for your support. Questions? Do we take public input on this as it's a provisional budget? I don't think so. I think that would be done in September at our um, final adoption. So we will take the comments at that time. This is the adoption of the provisional budget. So, Carol. You have a public hearing the first Tuesday after Labor Day on the budget. On the budget. Thank you. Right after October 9th or September. No, September right after the first snowstorm. <laughs> um, <laughs> Looking for a motion to adopt the provisional budget. I make a motion to adopt the provisional budget. Second. Second. Third. Second by Benninga. All those in, uh, roll call vote, please. Barth. Aye. Bender. Aye. Benninga. Aye. Karski. Aye. And it's it will not like snow. like we had the votes there with three seconds. <laughs> yeah, the vote was not for snow. All right. Consider a motion to approve a budget reduction and authorize returning the remaining $33,093.38 of the one Sioux Falls budget supplement funds to the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation. Good morning, Lori. Good morning, Lori Montes, uh, Human Services Assistant Director. We have been working, uh, as you guys are aware, with the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation in dispensing one Sioux Falls funds. We really began last 
April in the midst of uh, COVID-19 and assisted people with rent, mortgage, and utilities over the course of the last uh, year plus uh, for people that had had uh, financial hardships due to COVID. And so um, with the implementation of the state's funds, the South Dakota CARES funds, uh, the needs are being met primarily through that uh, route now. And so we haven't been using the One Sioux Falls funds all that often. We still do once in a while, um, but they are interested in having those funds uh, that they granted to us returned to them kind of as seed money for the next um, knock on wood <laughs> um, disaster that may occur in Sioux Falls. So I'm um, just looking to return the remaining funds back to the foundation. Questions for Lori? Make a motion to return the funds to the Sioux Falls Area Community Foundation. Second. Roll call vote, please. Bender? Aye. Benega? Aye. Barth? Absent. Aye. Aye. Motion carries three to zero. All righty. Thank okay. you, Lori. Thank you. So now we have a briefing to solicit public comments on proposed nominations by the State Historical Society Board of Trustees of two properties listed below to the National Register of Historic Places and authorize the chair to sign chief elected officials report for submission to the State Historic Preservation Officer. Sounds official. Uh, morning, Bill. You want to tell us about these properties? <coughs> sure. Bill Hoskins, director of the Sioux Land Heritage Museum. This is really the commission acting under one of your other hats as the county's board of preservation. Um, there are two nominations. One is for the Oli Fast House, uh, 2603 482nd Street in Corson. Uh, it's a white frame house built in 1902. Uh, the other property is a 1928 barn in Mapleton Township at uh, 47669 257th Street, Mapleton Township. Um, both of these structures have been nominated uh, to be placed on the National Register of Historic Places. The State Historic Preservation Office wrote both nominations. The nominations appear in my opinion to be in proper form and and that the properties uh, meet the minimum qualifications for being placed on the register. I think that if you uh, ask for any public comment, if there is none, I think you're done. If there is comment, those comments need to be reported and on, <clears throat> on the referred to form and signed and passed on. Thank you, Bill. Questions for Bill? So this is just to get public comments. It is not officially putting them on? Right. This is, this is just soliciting public comments on <coughs> these houses being nominated. Whose action does it take to officially put them on? <coughs> Do we, are from, we involved in from, that process? From here it will go to the uh, State Board of Preservation, which is the State Historical Society's board. They're meeting, I th think, in early September uh, to review that. If they have their favorable stamp, then it will be submitted to the Secretary of Interior. I'm just... Or, and, and that, the, the Interior Department makes the decision. Can you kind of break it down why this board has to be involved in the process? I mean, I, I'm, I'm confused. I, basically, putting these on the, the role or the, the historical society stuff, I mean, makes them un untouchable. I mean, no, well, no, it doesn't. They can't be torn down. Well, they can be. Okay, yeah, if the state historical society approves it. Well. But I'm just curious why this board needs to be involved in this process. Do you have any? <coughs> idea? Uh, Commissioner, I, I think um, I believe it has to do with the historic preservation laws. And, and at one point, there was a separate county board of preservation that reviewed these. And, and there hasn't been for 
20 years or more. Uh, and and the, in the past, there aren't many of these that come down the road. Mm -hmm. The commission acts as that board of preservation. And, um, you know, are, are these buildings that meet the qualifications for the nomination? They do. And what they're asking for is simply public comment. Okay. Any other questions? Commissioner Bart. So, Bill, uh, do the owners of these properties want this to happen? Yeah, they're the ones who initiated the process. They've been working with the State um, Historic Preservation Office, and, and the state is the one who actually wrote the nominations, did, did all the legwork and paperwork for this. I just mentioned that because once that's done, uh, you know, if I decided to replace the roof, I might not be allowed to, even though I own the house. It's kind of my point, and I'm sorry for putting you on the spot there, Bill, but, um, <coughs> it, yeah. Sometimes well, the it, city of Sioux Falls has, a, has its, uh, a board of preservation that would act on most of these, but the county doesn't, and, and they don't come around. It's, it's been five, six years at least since the last one we saw. Okay. All righty. So look for a motion to... Are we looking for public Oh, no, comment? it's a briefing. Oh, it's this a briefing. is a briefing. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Um, looking for... So we have a resolution authorizing the highway department to submit applications to the South Dakota Department of Transportation for the 2022 Bridge Improvement Grant Big Funds. Jacob. Jacob, good morning. Hey, hi, my name yeah. is Shannon Schultz. I'm the Assistant Highway Superintendent presenting Jacob's item. And as you read it, Commissioner, uh, that is correct. It were by rule or following DOT procedures, when we apply for bridge improvement grant funds, it needs to be accompanied by a resolution. And the resolution basically states that we are committed as a county to pay our 20% share. In the agenda item before you, you can see the four structures listed. And just to be complete, I will say them. 5216015, 5219015, 5273090, and 5330159. Uh, we, we believe we have a fighting chance to compete for the funding based on our big scores. In this instance, the higher the score, the more likely you are to be awarded points in this competitive grant program. And so really all we're doing is asking to, uh, to have uh, pass the resolution that, that supports the 20%. There's no guarantee we'll get one or any of them. Uh, we do think we'll maybe get one or two, but uh, our scores are pretty tight right there. So we went ahead and put all four in and uh, looking for your support. All righty, questions of Shannon? Comments from Commissioner Bender. Shannon, can you just confirm or comment on how these are these projects or this these funds are twenty percent is included in our budget, the they highway are. budget? These these bridges are already in the program. Uh, we brought a bridge that needed to be posted last week. That was a new posting. Uh, we're going to pay for those in house with in house dollars. These are going to be, you know, they're out in the, in the program a little bit, and. Uh, if we're going to build them with in-house dollars and they're eligible for big funds, obviously we want to take the big funds, and so they're in the program. Gene. Thank you. Okay. Questions, comments? This is a resolution, so I'm looking for a motion. Make a motion to approve. Second. All right. All those, uh, do you want a roll call vote? Okay, roll call vote. Senegal? Aye. Bart? Aye. Bender? Aye. Garcia? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Thank you, Shannon. Um, Authorized chair to sign an agreement between Minneapolis County and Summit Food Services, LLC, for comprehensive institutional food service and technology services for the county jail. Mr. Matson. Good morning. Good morning, Warden. How are we doing today? Good. Um, uh, as you read there, um, we're looking w to sign this contract. Uh, previously, we came to the commission um, to award Summit th the contract, uh, and then the plan was to come back. Uh, with a contract. We're at that point now. Um, I wanted to be clear in my presentation to you guys that when we initially looked at our 
uh, comparison between the two proposals. Um, we are comparing uh, two hot meals and a cold meal across both companies. Um, we still, we saw some it was a, the option that we wanted to go with. Um, the other company did include a selection of three hot meals during the day, which is historically what we've done in the jail. Um, so I reached out to Summit and said, could you give me a three hot proposal? So they did. Um, Price-wise, uh, they're the same for the regular tray. Um, but again, we talked about our, our, our business relationship, our long-term business relationship with Summit. Um, we're very satisfied with the uh, relationship that we have with them and that their technology services are a little bit more robust than uh, the other proposal. Um, that also with, we already have established interfaces which also cost money and you don't know if they're gonna work when they, they work those out, when they program those. So uh, we, we still wanna continue with Summit. Um, the, the lag, of time it took me to come back with a contract was because Drew DeGroote from the state's attorney's office and I really went through the contract um, and then we sent it back to them and it, they had to go through it again and so it just took some time. But we're here today and ready to go. Questions, uh, Mr. Matson. What's for lunch? Mm -hmm. uh, I have no idea what's for lunch today. <laughs> I make a motion to approve this contract. I authorize you to sign it, Mr. Chair. Second. Motion and a second. Call the roll. Barth? Aye. Bender? Aye. Seneca? Aye. Karski? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Along the same line, authorized chair to sign amendment number four to the Summit Food Services LLC agreement under the Federal Student Lunch Program for the Juvenile Detention Center. Mr. Gravitt, good morning. Good morning. Jamie Gravitt, director of Ju the Juvenile Detention Center. Uh, this is kind of a piggyback to what they were doing. Our delay was so that they could finish their contract. Uh, this is our fourth renewal of our current contract. It's our last one. Next year we'll have to RFP. Uh, so I'm asking you to approve this contract. Questions, comments, motions? I would make a motion to approve. Second. Call the roll. Senega? Aye. Barth? Aye. Bender? Aye. Karski? Aye. Thank motion you. carries. All right, briefing, briefing short, Elliot Hendrickson, Inc. on Highway 130 quarter study final report. It just doesn't read right, so good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is Al Murra. I'm with SCH Engineering. And um, yeah, so today I'm just here to provide a briefing uh, update on the final report that was completed for the uh, County Road 130 transportation planning study. Um, and maybe just a, a brief overview. I think um, a lot of you have probably seen some of this information. Um, but the corridor is, is a two mile stretch on 130 um, from the Crooks Corner, which is County Road 37, two miles east over to I-29 to the interstate, that's exit 86. And uh, so we looked at a um, high level transportation planning study, just um, some concerns that, um, uh, that needed to be looked at was uh, safety uh, and then the uh, potential um, increase in traffic along Highway 130 due to the development in the area. So. Um, I got I do have a few um, slides that we had at our public meeting. We had a public meeting in uh, June, on uh, June 1st. Uh, you can go to the next one. <coughs> sure. And so um, just kind of a recap. Um, uh, the 2045 uh, long range transportation plan indicated that there was um, likely going to be a significant increase in traffic on Highway 130 uh, by 2045. And so um, part of the traffic analysis, I won't get into all the details, but part of the analysis here, we, uh, we um, took existing counts, traffic counts out there in 2020. And then on this graphic here, uh, this is County Road 130. Uh, the left side is County Road 137. The right side is I-29. Uh, those three boxes indicate the traffic volumes um, at each of those locations, the top number, the top box is the 2020 counts, the bottom number is the 2045 forecasted traffic volumes, and then the middle is the 2030 uh, forecasted volumes. We did an interim um, analysis there just to see what those would look like. So 
Uh, there is, uh, this does confirm what uh, the long range transportation plan indicated as well. Uh, the, the significant increase in traffic um, looking at between Marion Road and, and the interstate up to uh, close to 20,000 vehicles a day. So, um, you can go to the next slide. So, part of our um, analysis, um, we, we combined looking at that, looked at traffic safety, um, we looked at access management. And we kind of came up with three different uh, time frames for improvements that would address or mitigate for those um, increases in, in uh, level of service uh, in which you get traffic congestion. So uh, we looked at a near term, a short term, and a long term. The near term would be uh, improvements, uh, potential improvements within the next one to two years. Uh, and so on this slide here, you can see there's, there's two locations. No, on the top there, that's uh, the Crooks Corner. That's County Road 130 and County Road 137. Uh, we looked at two alternates there. Um, alternate A on the left is a stop control intersection, which would function similar that it does today, um, where there's stop signs, um, with the addition of a north and southbound left turn lane, a separate left turn lane, and then a westbound right turn lane. Um, <clears throat> We also looked at, on the right side there, alternate B, which is a roundabout. Um, both of these options um, have an acceptable level of service, which is B or better. Um, roundabouts are, are generally thought of as safety, uh, safer. Um, traffic studies show that um, there's usually, uh, I believe, a 90 to 95% reduction in fatalities, 75% uh, reduction in injury crashes, and a 30 to 35 percent overall uh, crash uh, improvement. So um, they are generally considered a, a safer option. Um, but as I mentioned too, both, both uh, options uh, function um, acceptably. So um, the bottom graphic there, uh, which is uh, the other location near term improvement is at Marion Road or 400, 471st Street. And so um, the City of Sioux Falls is currently in the process of um, designing um, Marion Road a uh, road project from 130, about a mile and a half south to where the pavement uh, ends right now. So today this segment is gravel and they're looking to pave that uh, within the next couple of years. And so at that time um, there would need to be uh, on 130 we would need a westbound, we'd need a left turn lane and then in the northbound direction on Marion Road, we need a right turn lane there. Uh, so th those would be uh, near-term improvements. And so we can go to the next, next slide. So uh, short-term improvements, this would be in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, this is uh, based off from some of the interim numbers that we looked at, that uh, 2030 timeframe. Um, we would be looking at uh, adding a signal at the Marion Road intersection, adding a second westbound left turn lane um, at that same intersection. And then the corridor between Marion Road over to I-29 would become a three lane section. They would have a center dual left turn lane. And then on the right edge of this, uh, this aerial, if you slide over um, a little bit, yeah, so at the intersection there with Cottonwood, um, at this point in time we would, uh, see a, a right turn lane in the east and westbound direction and a left turn lane, or no, excuse me, a, a left turn lane in the, in the northbound and southbound, we'd have a right turn lane, yeah, a left turn lane in the east and, and westbound directions. Um, and so those would be uh, short term improvements. And then we also uh, forecasted out, if we go to the, to the next slide, um, the 2045, uh, this, is, this is where we have, um, the, the 16 to 20,000 vehicles a day. Um, at this point, you're look, starting to look at an arterial street. Um, and so what we have shown here, um, and this is high level concept type planning stuff. Um, the, uh, this is the city of Sioux Falls. This is their standard arterial section. It's got two lanes in each direction. It's got a raised center median uh, with left turn lanes. It's got signals at the quarter mile uh, intersections. Um, and then it would have, um, side pass along the back of curb at each of the locations. Um, the Cottonwood Avenue uh, intersection that's there today, that would get 
uh, moved west to Dawson, the, there'd be a, a full signal access there at Dawson to meet the quarter mile spacing requirements. So uh, that's kind of high level concept planning type stuff. Uh, um, the collector streets, which are, which are shown as those red lines that go north and south, those would obviously be, de be dependent on, on how things develop uh, on either side of the corridor. Um, and certainly um, there'd be collaboration with, with the city of Sioux Falls, city of Crooks, uh, the Sioux Falls MPO, the Foundation Park, uh, you know, as things uh, move forward to get to, to even that point, so. Um, we had a public meeting on June 1st. Uh, just a little bit of information uh, about the public meeting. Um, it was at the City of Crooks Community Center. Uh, we gave a short presentation, uh, followed by an informal open house uh, where we had people, uh, we had, we had um, boards with, with some of these exhibits uh, all around the room, and then we had um, staff there uh, from the study advisory team, uh, county staff, uh, there to talk to people about um, about the presentation, about what's going on, um, answer any questions. Um, the turnout we had 105. We had a really really good turnout. We packed the place, um, and so we had a we had a really good turnout. Uh, 105 people. Not everybody signed in, so we know we had more than 105. Uh, uh, the county did a Zoom for the presentation. Uh, we had seven people join online. Uh, we had comment cards there for people to fill out, and uh, they they could submit them. Uh, that same night or they could mail those in. We had seven that were returned and kind of listed there just some of the comments that we um, received and, and uh, can run through, you know, can construct a new interchange. We heard that a lot from people uh, at I-29 and 259th Street. That would be along I-29, that'd be a mile north of the system interchange of 90 and then it would be a mile south of 80, exit 86. So um, right now that's, a, that's considered a, a rural interstate and so there's a two mile spacing requirement um, and so as of right now that wouldn't meet the the spacing requirement to put an interchange there um, some comments about negative impacts uh, along properties uh, there's some there's some there's some nice places along there some nice properties along there um, there's safety concerns um, speeding um, additional truck traffic um, you know, pulling in and out of their driveways, uh, you know, just, just general safety concerns um, that people had. Um, comment that Foundation Park should, should maybe pay for the improvements, uh, extend Dawson south down to, to 130. That, that, that could be something that might need to be looked at further with, with everybody. Um, you know, it might be a viable option to get people down into the Foundation Park and provide a second access in and out of the park there for them. Um, there's obviously some, some land uh, concerns uh, with, with you know having to buy right away and, and such to build that. Um, there was both comments for and against a roundabout at the corner, uh, the Crooks Corner 137. Um, comment to go big from the start, uh, meaning you know what let's let's not do a project now and then do another project. Let's maybe see if we can't think about a way to, to combine it and, and get it done once, uh, and then keep the community involved. We heard that a lot too at the meeting, uh, just to make sure that everybody's involved as they move forward. So. Okay, thank you, Mr. Morales. Uh, if there's any, any questions or not. Yep. This is a briefing on a study that was done. This isn't to say that we're putting the traffic there. We're just anticipating the traffic there. Um, you know, 2045 is a long way out. You know, if Commissioner Barth is still with us and driving, we want to make sure the roads are wide. And, My driving is getting yeah. worse. Yeah. <laughs> And the other thing, you know, 2045, Amazon's still there. You know, they have a fleet of self-driving trucks. I mean, we, we don't know what it's going to look like. We, we're just doing our best to anticipate based on current things. So um, roundabouts, I guess the only question I have on a roundabout is are, when we look at that, are we, you know, this is still rural and a lot of ag out there. Can a roundabout accommodate a tractor pulling a large implement, a disc, a seed? You know, I've, I've had that come up. Sure, and, that, and that's a good question, and that would be something that would have to get looked at, you know, probably a little bit closer. Um, it may be a design question, but, you know, they can be designed for, um, you know, various, you know, sizes. You know, you go over to, to Worthington, you know, they have one right by JBS there that uh, they have a lot of large truck traffic that comes in there. I know they don't have the, the ag uh, equipment come through there, but mm -hmm. uh, definitely something that would want to be looked at because we heard that comment as well. Okay, uh, okay. Other questions, comments, Commissioner Barth? Uh, 
I do believe actually that our driving in this area is getting worse and worse. I, I don't remember traffic uh, craziness this bad since I was in Rome, Italy. But you take a look at the roundabout. Uh, people, I see them all the time. Running red lights. I don't think you can run a roundabout. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it, the other day uh, I had a person uh, by Menards on Veterans Parkway pass me on the right when there was no shoulder. He, he actually went on the dirt with two wheels on the asphalt and uh, I had another person uh, uh, on the interstate uh, uh, take the exit ramp and then merge back into traffic to pass me on the right. <laughs> Um, it's yep. that's sensing nuts. a common theme here. <laughs> <laughs> There's not enough enforcement on the law. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, Commissioner. <laughs> hey, I was at a stoplight. What am I supposed to do? <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Al, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. You bet. All righty. Uh, briefing on proposed 2022 legislative resolutions and adoption of resolution for SDACC consideration. Morning, Carol. Good morning, Commissioners. Carol Muller, Commission Office. It's that time of year where, you're, where you were already starting to think about legis proposed legislation that you would like to see brought before SDACC to bring to the South Dakota Legislature in January. So before you today are um, two different sources of conversations that you've had. Uh, I believe this is the fourth year that we have done joint resolutions with the uh, city of Sioux Falls and uh, some of the smaller cities and other surrounding counties may do those also. We recognize that for our legislators, it's really nice for us to talk about what we all support and uh, recognize the strength in that. So we have two that are coming in through that way. The first is we support legislation that establishes a new state grant program funded by the American Rescue Plan Act, the ARPA funds, to incentivize new housing stock by reducing local costs associated with expanding water and wastewater infrastructure. We recognize that that infrastructure is a large part of new housing and can those dollars, can a program be utilized to um, um, subsidize to support and uh, increase the affordability of housing. The second one is we support efforts to provide diversion services for youth and adults, diverting low-level offenders to community services and case management, reducing unnecessary incarceration and justice system involvement while successfully reducing the criminal behavior of participants in diversion. Minnehaha County has been doing this for several years now. Uh, we've had success in that area. Um, we've had a diversion program for, for youth. We're getting started with adults through the state's attorney's office. And uh, we would support efforts to continue to provide and fund those services. In addition, there were two, fo there were two resolutions that are presented as follow-up to commission and staff input. One is we support prohibition of juvenile detention facilities used to hold a minor who meets the criteria for our mental health and voluntary commitment. Right now, a 15, 16, 17-year-old who may be on a mental health hold and uh, often, often ends up in JDC. And they've not committed a crime, they're not accused of anything, but they end up going to JDC. So we would look to uh, prohibit that and for the state to find other resources, identify and support those. The other one is uh, a conversation that Commissioner Barth brought up um, two, three weeks ago, and have had some conversation with staff, have had some good input from them, and that is looking at the valuation of property, of housing, for, for people who are on an elderly or property tax freeze. And the concern right now is that the valuation, the inflation, the increase in housing is exceeding what that as to how it's indexed. So on here, we support the review of the housing valuation for elderly and disabled tax, disabled tax property freezes. It is not bringing forward any legislation to do that other than stating it needs to be looked at. It needs to be reviewed on a statewide basis. So with that, you have four resolutions that uh, we would be forwarding up to SDACC yet in the next couple days. And I believe each resolution needs to be done individually. Yes, correct. Okay. okay. How do we want 
do we need to read anything on these resolutions? How do you want so that they're addressed all indivi individually, I guess, on our briefing materials there? We could let that be in the record, can't we, just in the minutes maybe? Well, the entire resolution will be in the minutes. Yeah. And what I read to you actually there is, therefore be it resolved, is the language. Um, I would treat these like a consent agenda, um, that you treat them all as one unless somebody on the, the commission would like to pull them individually to make a particular political statement, so. Any statements? Uh, Commissioner Barth. <laughs> I would just say that I uh, brought up that uh, valuation issue uh, in consultation with Chris Lilla, who mentioned it to me. And uh, oh. he may want to say something. I don't Mr. Lilla. Good morning, Commissioners. Chris Lilla, Equalization. Yeah, so Jeff had contacted me asking if there was any anything that I saw out there that would require possible legislative changes. And, and this has been a suggestion um, from me based on my experience over the past years. The housing values, we don't know how many people are being disqualified by the limitation of the house value. Um, some of the points I make is it's an annual application regardless if they've qualified before or not, and it's and the first criteria is income-based. The income-based we don't have any control over really. That is, that is indexed each year annually by CPI and such. The concern that I have is the housing values, and that is indexed every year with, with a slight increase in that. But the problem that I see is the limitation of a house value being at 202000 for 2021. If you've never been an applicant before, never received elderly freeze, and it's the first time and your income falls below the threshold and, and you would qualify via income, but your property value exceeds 202,000, you are disqualified. <clears throat> when I say we don't know what we don't know is people that come in there, they look and they say with the auditor's office, yep, we looked at your income, you meet, they pull up the current property value or the previous year's property value and it exceeds, they don't make application, they're, they're disqualified. So we don't keep track of how many are getting turned away. My concerns stem from the 202,000 limit. I use my hometown of Hecla as an example. I could build a brand new 2,000 square foot home in Hecla, South Dakota, and probably put $400,000 of value into that property. The market value in Hecla is not gonna exceed $200,000. That's just the reality. There's no market, there's no school, there's no industry, there's no anything. None to South Dakota. That house, a brand new house, is going to be tough to value at 200000 When we move down to Sioux Falls, and specifically in some of our larger entities, our housing market and the values of homes have grown so exponentially, so rapidly, I fear that we are excluding a lot of potential applicants that meet the income criteria. Now, just because of inflationary or market values, their, their property value on a first-time application could potentially be denied. So I, 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 when Jeff asked me, I just brought this up as, as conversation. I don't know the answer. I'm, I don't have any suggestions as to how it would be remedied, but I think it's time with our current market for heads bigger than ours to take a look at it and, and see if it's still relevant or if there needs to be some other adjustments or made to it. So that's the comments I have. And I would point out that the request on this is for a study to yeah, we don't know if there's a problem, so we're not going to try to s solve something that there is no problem for. So any questions, Chris? So we're going to look for a motion to accept um, all four of these resolutions on a blanket basis. So uh, moved. Second. I'll roll call vote, please. Barth? Aye. Bender? Aye. Benega? Aye. Carthy. Aye. Motion carries. All righty. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Chris. Uh, briefing and demonstration to consider two options regarding the integration of Beacon software into Minneapolis County. Brian Smith, Chris Lilla. Hello again, Commissioners. Chris Lilla, Equalization. I, I'm pretty excited to bring this forward. Um, just for the public's knowledge, we currently have a property tax record system that the public can access, appraisers can access, insurance agents, banks, basically anybody can get, go to our current system and, and gather information on, on properties and their values and taxes and tax history and pay taxes online. It's been a functional uh, web application that's been applied for 12 plus years here. 
uh, we can enhance that with this product, and that's really what I'm looking for. I, Ryan, I've got Ryan Smith here. I'll introduce him here in just a second and let him go. Uh, this is a one-stop shop application where we can pull all data sources from county to have it represented in a web format that anyone at their home can access at any time. Uh, we, generally, this is set up as a, a free site for minute information where you can get the legal descriptions, the property classes, the values, the tax history, things like that. So anybody can look up their property, see all of that stuff. That's generally how, how this software is set up. Then we go into a subscription or a per record lookup fee, which is currently what we have in place. Then you get additional details. I guess the biggest contrast between what we currently have now versus what I would propose that we would move to is the enhancements. You get all the same characteristics, you get the same values, you get, you get the sales history, that's all fine and dandy. What this brings forward that our other software is lacking or we have the inability to provide is property sketches, photographs, linking directly to a GIS map layer where you can see sales surrounding you, um, comparable searches, we have the ability to mask data in, in is it Marcy's Law? Um, we, we just really, technology-wise, blow this up. On the selling side for myself is our staff time. Uh, right now, through our current system, we are getting, uh, boy, I don't know, Monty might be able to help me out, how many, how many requests we're getting monthly or annually through that one. Since people requesting data from that system are not getting all of the details that they desire, my staff on top of that, we are averaging 600 property cards a month that we are printing to PDF and emailing out. That's time that that could be better served within our office, taking care of our needs. We're getting a little behind. So um, so with that, I guess my thoughts are just kind of a broad overview of the product. I've got Ryan here um, with Schneider Corporation representing Beacon, the software. I'll have him go through a quick PowerPoint, a live demonstration, and then I would like to come back to kind of if, if there's a consensus from the commission to look at moving forward with this option to bring some technology. Um, I'll discuss option one and option two. Thank you, Chris. Ready? Yep. Good morning, everyone. How's it going? It's good to see people in person. <laughs> uh, yeah, as Chris said, my name is Ryan Smith. Um, just a quick correction. Uh, the official name of our company is Schneider. What? Sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's Schneider Geospatial, not Schneider Corp. But yeah, I just want to make the, just for the record. Um, do we got the demo? OK. Is there a way to get to the PowerPoints? Is it that PDF? Oh, it's actually in the packet. OK. Gotcha. I'll have to trust you. There it is. Thanks for your patience, everyone. I knew I should have asked for a recess. All right, can everybody see that? We good? Okay. Well, uh, once again, um, there's nothing like going last in a public meeting after a bunch <laughs> of nuisance complaints. Um, but thank you for the entertainment earlier. I appreciate it. Uh, anyways, uh, my name is Ryan Smith. Uh, I work with Schneider Geospatial. I've been with Schneider now for about nine years, uh, off and on. Um, and uh, today, uh, I'm going to be showing you the Beacon product. Uh, Beacon is currently in uh, over 600 counties in the United States, so that ends up being about one-fifth of the United States in terms of actual county count. Um, in South Dakota, more specifically, we are in 19 counties. So what is Beacon? Uh, really what it is is it's, it's really about just changing the how, how the way citizens interact with local government. The, um, with, with respect to time, the way I like to say it is you have different types of citizens that are looking for different types of data. Um, uh, I'm 38 years old. I like to poke around on the website first before I call. My parents might call the office first before they go down to the county office, and my grandparents are going to make a whole day of it, and they're going to go down to the county office and walk around the town square, the whole thing. Um, so with that being said, though, but you're dealing with different types of citizens all the time. And so we like, um, like to say that Beacon is your online courthouse. And I think it really showed that the last 18 months uh, during the pandemic. Uh, we're an award-winning uh, software, as I said before. 
Uh, business partners, I did see earlier you were showing pictometry imagery. We are business partners with Eagle View uh, pictometry as well. And really here's the breakdown. It's search report map. That's really what Beacon is. Um, it's to prevent very easy phone calls, or you know, phone calls in Chris's office, and the auditor's office, whatever it might be, um, the state's attorney office. Uh, they're able, instead of having to call maybe in, they can just go on here first. And with that, uh, also to, besides the search reporting and the mapping, there's the comparable searches that you can do. And that's what Chris talked about, that I would consider more of a premium search. That's more maybe your realtors, uh, some uh, people on the commercial um, side of the industry, uh, where you're looking for maybe something more specific than just your own property. And then it'll generate results. And then also, too, you can also map that. So that's where I get back to that whole search report map, um, where you can actually see those results on the map. Chris talked about earlier, just uh, pre on the previous agenda item, talking about home values that are 200 and 2,000. This is something that where you could quickly look up all home values that are over or under 200, 2,000 uh, in a quick search. You can generate mailing labels. Um, this is probably one of our simplest, but by far the most popular um, is the mailing label. And I will show that um, in the live demo. But really what it is on the left-hand side, you've got an area. Uh, let's say you have a property uh, with a nuisance complaint with like goats or uh, anything related to raccoons. What you can do is if you need to notify um, all people within a certain distance, you can do that and create that mailing label and then notify all citizens if you need to have a special public meeting uh, with your planning and zoning. So, notice how I'm keeping a good straight face here. Um, also, too, you can do sales search as well. If I need to search uh, sales in the last month, last two months, um, as I assume you're getting into falls. I live in Des Moines, uh, Iowa, and we're just seeing a huge boom with home values. Uh, I'm sure the market's going crazy here, too. Um, so this is a good way if you want to search um, just recent sales in the last month uh, or whatever you need to do. Also, there's a tax estimator. This helps out with a lot of questions, which is, what are my taxes? What if I add this garage? How much taxes will it add? So this is something that we also have as well that is available on the Beacon website. Uh, where uh, it has simple drop downs there with the property type. Let's say I'm adding maybe an exemption. So then I can, as a citizen, I can at least look to see into the future what my taxes might be. Obviously, it's not going to be guaranteed, and we put that disclaimer on there. Uh, but it's just more to help eliminate some of those little one off phone calls for your office. And then document access as well. Um, really, I mean, everything from bridge reports to uh, sketches. Uh, so it just anything that's involved with the property that has historical data, historical permits, uh, whatever needs to be looked up in a timely manner. And then also assessment mapping layer, layers. This is one of my actual, one of my more favorite uh, things I like to show off. Um, more just taking all of those Excel sheet uh, data and putting it on a map, uh, whether it be grade, uh, permits that have been applied for. You can even make a layer for if you want to look at maybe appeals where they're being mapped. I think if you have you have that mapping feature too, that you get a better sense of uh, you know where some of these things are coming from. As I talked about earlier, Eagle View, and then also we have subscription types. Uh, there's different ones. Uh, Chris specifically asked me for uh, a records view because that is, from what I understand, that's the way Minnehaha does it at the moment. So, so yes, that is available. And then also, too, there's a lot of data QC tools on the back end, uh, whether it be just, um, just making sure that there's a, if there's a GIS polygon, but maybe there might not be a camera or tax rec record attached to that. Uh, using Beacon, you can quickly identify uh, that, that missing piece of data. And then also, too, site usage charts as well. Um, it's always interesting to see the site usage in that uh, you always see a spike during Thanksgiving week and Christmas week, and being the son of a farmer from Illinois, I'm always convinced it's because people sit around and ask who owns what property, and then they argue, and then here I am with my smartphone uh, saying, no, this person owns that, and they're like, no, I don't think you're right. And I'm like, well, okay, I guess I'm looking up the public record. I, you know, this is the right, and it's like, okay, grandma, I guess you're right, so. Um, but anyways, it's, uh, it's just a nice way to look up a lot of different information. Um, the board would allow, I'd be happy to do a quick online demonstration of it, if you would like. Um, I understand I'm last on the agenda and everyone's ready to go eat lunch, 
but um, I'll leave that it's up to you. It's been a long meeting, and we've been here since 8. I, I, I think Chris kind of went through this with yep. everybody who's been interested. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah. yeah. So yes, I, I, just, I, I guess I want to say is I prepared for a live demo, but I want to be respectful of your time, so I'll let you decide that. We appreciate that. Yep. De definitely helps in sales. This isn't my first uh, public meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> So yeah, I, again, uh, we I'm super excited to bring this forward. It, I've worked with Beacon in, in my past position um, for I think since 2008 until I came to Minnehaha County and and it, it, and Ryan's I don't know I don't want to throw him under the bus, but I was literally here on day three and he called me and said, "When are you going to get me before the commission in Minnehaha County? You guys need this product." And I've held him at bay. I, I, I've really held him off. I said, you've got to let me get our full conversion, get on our final two product, which is ProVal and ENCODE, and we're here. So I'm true to my word. I said we would look at bringing this forward um, with the commission's blessing. I think it's a great enhancement and a great upgrade for, for Minnehaha County should you decide that you are willing to move forward. It says two options. What yep. are the two options? So, so the two options that we're looking at, if the commission is in consensus that, yes, this is something they would like to see us move forward with, um, option one <clears throat> basically would get us starting right away with Beacon Software. We'd be looking at an October 1 startup. Obviously, we've got some contractual things we've got to work out, um, things like that. Uh, what that does, Beacon is a little more expensive than our current software. Um, the current one we're paying $1,200 a year annually for. Obviously, there is a, there's an increase in cost having added amenities and, and access and things like that. So there's a 17280 one-time fee to acquire Beacon. That's them making all the connections, testing everything, getting it all set up, the web application, the web address, things like that. Working with Monty, working with IT to get all of those connections and, and things. That's a one-time setup fee. That goes away after the initial. Um, and then, because we would be starting on October 1, we would be prorating the annual. So to get us from October 1, so October, November, December, we'd be looking at $5,685 fee to get us through the end of the year. Um, that was not budgeted for in my budget, so hopefully I would have enough reserves to help cover some <coughs> of that. If not, I would, be, I would be looking for supplemental in my 21 budget. Option two, if the commission is in favor of moving forward with this, is to hold off on this until January 1, 2022 is our beginning time. At that point, then, I would need, a, need an adjustment in my budget request for my 2022, since you've already got that in your provisional budget and this wasn't really on the radar yet. Um, I would be looking at adding an adjustment request to my 2022 budget. That then would in, would incur the seventeen thousand setup fee and the full annual fee of twenty two thousand seven hundred and forty dollars annually. Commissioner Carsey, yes. I could just ask a question. Yes. So I'm I'm curious why, um, if you you're so excited to bring it forward and you've been thinking about it since you showed up that it didn't show up in your twenty twenty two budget request. I was really looking at the next year's budget request. That's where I was, I, and, and if you looked at my, uh, my intentions and my future, I'd, I'd mentioned it in there, but I wasn't really ready. I didn't know if we were gonna get fully on ENCODE this year. I didn't, I, I had speculation of it, but when I've gotta prepare the budget request a couple months ago, I didn't even know if I was gonna be moving on to ENCODE as soon as, as soon as I am. So I was really looking at probably the next budget year, and then in, in conversations with Ryan and things like that, it was like, yeah, I'm here, let's bring it forward and, and see if it's a possibility. Um, as I mentioned with Carol earlier, my original intentions were to kind of have a demo and, and show you this and say, is this something you want? And then we would work on the details later on and it kind of went zero to a thousand pretty quick. Um, poor planning on my part, I would maybe say, uh, but I, I wasn't really intending on coming before you asking for money in this this year, I was looking at, at more in the next year. Um, but we're here and, and can I, yes. Can I add a comment? Yes. Okay, I, I just want to clarify. So the reason why there's two options was the original option was, okay, let's start now October 1st. Uh, Chris said, um, shared with me, hope you don't mind, yeah. is that, yeah, well, I have to make a budget adjustment, which I've dealt with before, I understand. And so that's why I said, well, in order to, um, work around that, so to speak, we can just have the contract start date be January 1st. 
October 1st date means guaranteed it starts October 1st. If you sign now and go with the January 1st start date, it'll probably, it, it'll still get implemented sometime in third quarter. I just can't guarantee that versus, um, you know, if it was an October 1st start date. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Mm -mm. No, not, not at all. <laughs> really? <laughs> Good, I'm glad I'm not the right? only one. <laughs> Did I not explain that right? You, you can't start it this year and not have us pay for it this year, right? I mean, you're, you that make it. That would be on us to just eat that cost. My, my whole thing is when, it, when I've worked with this before, sometimes then Chris has to go back to you and ask you for more money that was not budget, was not asked for the previous year. I think I'm digging my own grave here. I need to stop talking. But my, my point is, is if you do an October 1st start date, we guarantee they'll start October 1st. If you do a January 1st start date, it'll get done sometime in the next two to three months. That's all I'm trying to say. So, okay. Okay. Other questions? The room got really hot on this. I have a question. Yes. Um, I'm curious about um, the running this program at kind of a no cost to the county in the sense that the users essentially, um, the fees that we charge the users essentially pay for the um, right. software. And how, how is, what is the intent? I don't see any projections necessarily. Right, and that, about that's that. kind of an unknown. And I asked Ryan, I don't know if he's got anything on, sure. on the usage. Um, so in my past, when we got this, at, at, when I was at Brookings County, the, the commission's goal at that time was not to make revenue from this, to pay for it. And we did a subscription based at, at $400 a year for one to four users, unique IP addresses, $600 for five to eight, and then $800 for eight or more. So if you've got a bank and you want to have 30 employees have access to it, you paid $800 a year. Their goal was not to generate revenue, but to cover the expense of this and it did. It, it covered the expense and it generated about 24,000 additional revenue to offset other things. Down here, I'm looking at, because of what we do and we've got some, some power users out there, one of, the, one of the suggestions I would make, and it's fully up to the commission how they want it to go. If they wanted to go subscription-based, if they wanted to go per record, my suggestion would be that we continue on a per record request, which is similar to our, our current software. In order to ensure that all the costs were for this were recouped, um, I would suggest starting at, at the $2 a card, which is what we currently have. And in the future, we can look at it monthly, six months, eight months, nine months, a year. If it starts generating revenue in excess and the commission it's, isn't the desire to use that revenue to offset anything, we can go in at any time and reduce, reduce our amounts. And we have that ability right within our within our office through the beacon to go in there and say, instead of $2 a card, now maybe you've got, maybe you paid for 100, 100 records, so you've got a $200 out there. If we bring it forward and it, and it sustains itself and pays for itself, and it starts generating revenue, if it's the commission's wish, we can drop that to a dollar. Now instead of having 200 cards, you potentially could have 400 records out there that you have access to. It's fully flexible and, and uh, malleable. I just don't have the projections, because I don't know. I I just posted, uh, this is Johnson County, Iowa. This would be like where Iowa City is, just a comparable area to, to many, oh, sorry, a comparable area to Minnehaha County. And on that summary there, you can see in the last 365 days, on average, they get 17,000 requests for records per day. Oh. Um, average visits per day is 1,400, 1,300 people, 1,358. That's 1,358 phone calls that Chris's office does not have to take. Commissioner? Um, it probably is because it's been a long day already. I, mm -hmm. I'm not really in favor of moving forward in this right now. I would, I'm, I'm not in favor of trying to push and try to get it done by October. I'd be, I'm interested in the product. I do think it would be a good product for the county. I'd like to see a little more vetted out um, proposal for possibly starting next year, but with some, some estimates about what our usage has been, not Johnson County's, not that that doesn't sound impressive, but to kind of help us to understand exactly where we think the revenues would meet. And I'd rather have a little bit more um, robust plan in place before we approve it. I think 
No, go ahead. Go ahead, no, please. I just say, anyone and everyone in the real estate industry uses this website. I'll leave it at that. Um, I use the current site, so I know what I get and what I'm paying for. This seems to be a lot more meat on the bone than what I'm currently getting. Um, but I, it, I'm, I'm in favor of at least considering this as an option moving forward. I, I'm definitely on, on board with that. But I would like a, a little bit more data. I mean, the current system costs this and we get this. Moving to the new system will cost this and we're, we anticipate our revenues could be that. I mean, I, just a little bit more than um, we don't know, I guess. I, I get, so I'm, I'm in favor of this, but I do want more information so that I can, if somebody says, why would you have switched that? I can say, well, it's pretty simple. Look at the numbers, look at the math. So um, get, you know, 600 data cards in a month. I mean, that's significant. What do you expect in a drop in data cards? I mean, will it go from 600 to um, 400 or will it drop to 100? I mean, in all honesty, for our office, the 600 data request cards that we are get that is on top of what is already being requested through our current property site because they're not getting all the data. If they, if somebody were to call our office requesting that data card, we would refer them to the Beacon website because it would actually we charge 250 for us to produce that card and email out 50 cents more than they could get it online essentially. So so as as we would get those phone calls, we would say. We, we would now have a new Beacon website. Here's the web address. You can go get all of the information that we would give you at your convenience, and it takes away from us. And over time, that should should go to nearly nothing. Okay. Other questions? I don't really have a question. I mean, I did visit with a lot of real estate professionals. I mean, I, I do agree. I think a lot of, from what I heard, a lot of times the reason they're calling our offices because they can't pull two different buildings that are located on the same site, and so they have to call our office to get data on that. Um, but I do think we have an opportunity to get a little more robust business plan presented to the commission and then let us take some action on that. Other questions, comments? No, I would agree. When you look at the revenue that was projected in, in the third paragraph of $27,000, the $2 of charge is 13500 visits uh, doesn't make quite the sense from an economic standpoint that I'd like to have more information about. We talked about this yesterday, so I'm kind of, option one is too quick, option two is possibility with more information. And that's where that's where I was looking at, a consensus if it was, then if, we, if option two, that's really where I kind of fell, was starting at, on January 1, but if, if we're going to do that, since my budget was put in several months ago, I, I, I'm basically looking for, if there's a consensus, I would put in the, the budget adjustment request so I could have it placed like, in my budget. I'd like to see a business plan that outlines, okay. you know, old versus new and what, yeah, what you're anticipating, I guess. So, all righty. Good, good. All right. Thank you, Chris. All right, thank, thank you. You bet. Thank you very much, Ryan. All right, um, to the point of liaison reports. Any liaison reports? Mr. Remender. I just say that um, the Accessible Housing Advisory Board met last week. It's the, the new HAB. Um, now it's the AHAB. Uh, and, you know, we have had some, it's, that reconstituted group has been really um, effective, I think. We have opportunities now to influence how um, some city and state housing funds get allocated, which has been good. Um, you know, affordable housing continues to be a huge challenge, so I was very supportive of the um, that coming to the state to try to get some additional funds towards that. But, um, you know, we even have had challenges with projects that we had given tentative approval to, given the, the um, construction costs that folks are having to deal with. It's um, a it's a big heavy lift to try to get additional affordable units. And so we continue to focus on that as kind of just a FYI, we will be, I will be coming forward with some proposed um, bylaw changes that, which are really pretty technical in nature just to uh, address some changes that have been made um, at the city and the way they structure their 
department. And just to clarify that um, the at-large members for that committee can be residents of Minnehaha County or anywhere within the city of Sioux Falls. There was some confusion about um, whether that included folks that lived in the city of Sioux Falls but were in Lincoln County. So that, that will be coming forward. Okay. Commissioner Barth. Uh, had a public advocate uh, meeting on Monday and uh, things are going well. Uh, there's a small concern about uh, professional services on the budget. Uh, they're worried that they'll go higher than uh, they budgeted for. Also last night then we had a Planning and Zoning Commission meeting and it only went till 9 o'clock. Um, we, uh, uh, we had a couple of uh, water uh, towers that were approved. Uh, we had a, uh, uh, a complaint about a, uh, a lime uh, stockpile that uh, was in for conditional uh, approval as it was operating previously without and uh, the neighbors didn't like it. Uh, this lime is used for treating uh, drinking water and then they dry it out and apply it to agricultural fields. Uh, but the storage of it uh, looks like uh, piles of snow from winter snow removal. And it's in a pretty popular area there just south of Cedar Ridge, uh, which is uh, that uh, equestrian uh, development on uh, uh, Highway 115. Anyway, uh, uh, of course, it's uh, going to cause widespread uh, death and everything in the neighborhood there. Property values are going, uh, health is being destroyed. Anyway, uh, we approved uh, uh, a five-year continuing operation for them, at which time uh, they would have to uh, cease operations. And we also uh, insisted that they, they've been using kind of a farm road, I would call it. Uh, there's a gravel road that goes by 257th and then they drive off into their field behind their cornfield and dump all this stuff. But that uh, uh, farm road is just black dust. And uh, uh, it's, uh, we may, are going to make them uh, gravel 600 feet of that road and uh, put down some dust suppression. We also then had um, a uh, uh, expansion for the a uh, wedding barn over by the Veterans Cemetery. And while uh, uh, the city uh, was not opposed to it, they wanted to have them pay platting fees, which um, would be $80,000. And uh, the county planning voted unanimously in favor of allowing them to do their project with, without the platting fee requirement. The city uh, voted it down three to two, so it'll come to a joint, a joint meeting. Um, uh, this is in what they call, I think, Zone 3, which means that they're not planning on putting water and sewer out there for 30 years. In the meantime, they were saying that some of this money could be used to cover the maintenance on the road and stuff. Not that the city does any maintenance on the road or is paving it or, anyway, uh, it kind of uh, rubbed me the wrong way. Although Eric may have a different opinion here, being a uh, uh, persuaded of the city's uh, primacy in this type of thing, I'm uh, I'm not, and uh, so. Uh, uh, but we had a interesting meeting. You guys should come. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs> and Scott is here if you wanted to ask him any. Any other liaison reports? Uh, the only thing I have tomorrow, I have a link board meeting that goes to 11.45 and a chamber board meeting that starts at 11.45. I, and I cannot make the chamber board meeting. Would it, any of you like to attend the chamber board meeting as the liaison tomorrow? Do they have free food? <laughs> <laughs> Always a consideration, yes. <laughs> I, Commissioner Heiberger's out of town, so if, um, if anybody would like to, just let me know, please. All right. Okay, so that's 
two what? Yeah, it's under routine business, so. I can make that motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed, same sign, motion carries. Any new business? I have one just update. Uh, last week, uh, Commissioner Hybrider and I met with the uh, consortium on the medical cannabis draft of zoning ordinances and uh, I would say the city of Sioux Falls and Minnehaha County are similar. Uh, Lincoln County is a little more open, to say the least. Uh, we are proposing at this point that the number of medical uh, establishments be one dispensary in Sioux Falls and in Minnehaha County. Uh, we're looking at zone districts of commercial and light industrial. Uh, we also have the sensitive use uh, definition of single family dwelling, elementary, middle, and high school, churches, daycares, parks, and public use facilities. Uh, both of us have uh, distance of sensitive uses of 1,000 feet and dispensaries of 1,000 feet, but if there's only one, that shouldn't be an issue. The county's, uh, uh, I saw Scott leave, but <clears throat> um, We've added some other conditions. One is proof of registration by the Department of Health, compliance with uh, the Department of Health requirements. Uh, indoor security is no, it, it has to be an indoor secured facility, no drive through, drop off, or pickup. Hours of operation were from 8 to 10. Uh, no admission, emission of dust, fumes, vapors, or odors. I'll give you this so you don't have to write it all down. No one under the 18 allowed uh, no use of cannabis in any facility, disposal plan, security plans. Lincoln County is very brief. Um, they would allow four dispensaries, um, same kind of district, zoning districts, same thousand feet, but no other conditions. So um, I'll get this uh, sent out to each of you, but um, it was quite the discussion and frankly the representation from the industry, so to speak. Uh, some of the information they provided, I would say, was uh, questioned. Uh, it's also been brought up that we need to consider fire and uh, even ask for more information and sharing of thought process with Brandon and with Dells. Um, the other thing that was uh, debated and not secured at that point was the fee structure. There's quite a range in fee structures. So it'll be interesting to see how all this comes together. And as most of you are aware, we'll be hopefully hearing from the Supreme Court pretty soon. And then the other thing is the state is going to have a special session, we've been told. So uh, all of that may change some of the process that we're going through. And then the last thing is this, uh, we're still talking about licensing related issues besides the zoning. I would say that uh, this has been a real educational process and looking back at some of the history that Colorado's gone through and some of the hassles they're dealing with, I've changed my mind about a lot of things uh, significantly. The one thing that I will just say that I've continually bugs me a little bit is the growth of medical issues with kids it going into the ER or ICUs has grown dramatically in some of the states where they've licensed medical cannabis. So that's all I have to say. It's, uh, it's educational and there is people talk about how much money we're going to make. I don't think there's anywhere close to accurate information about that. Mr. Chairman, yes, um, in regards to this, I know last night Scott Anderson uh, is planning to have a discussion of the ordinance uh, at our next planning commission meeting. I think it might take a two-day meeting, um, one day to do, uh, you know, nuisance or zoning issues and one day to do uh, cannabis. 
And let me also say that I think if we go with the thousand foot from a residence or a school, the logical place to have it is at the Sioux Empire Fairgrounds. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Other old business. All right. Um, are we going into exec session? I don't believe so. I, don't, I thought Carol said no, but it's on the agenda. So. I texted Carol and asked her. Uh, it, it's typically just carried on the agenda just in case. Yep, yep. So um, look for a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Second. We have a motion and a several seconds. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. Sorry about the Good job, commissioners. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for coming.